We should be live now, but I'm just going to double check it, Phil, on, on the yeah. Facebook to make sure it's streaming. Yeah, it's come up live in my feed there. You see it? Yeah. I'm banned for, from Facebook for seven days, unfortunately. <laughs> you keep getting put in the Facebook jail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The truth is not allowed to be told. Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen you like come in and out of it a few times. Like that's me back out of Facebook jail. <laughs> well, that's, that's incredible. Since when did they um, have the right to take away the freedom of speech? Eh? Yeah, I know. Well, I mean, I wouldn't mind if I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> you keep getting put in the Facebook jail. Right, we are definitely live. Speech, eh? Yeah, I know. Awesome. Well, right. I'm just going to turn my phone off now so that doesn't ring whilst we are yeah. chatting away. So. I better introduce Phil, and I've been thinking about like the, the introduction I was going to I was going to give for you, mate. And to be honest, like I've, Phil, I've only known you a, a few months now, and just to put things into perspective, like I've worked with a lot of people and got help from people with my health and my fitness and stuff. And usually, it takes um, maybe I'll follow someone for a few months to six months, and before they decide, wait, I'm going to send this guy a message. But Phil, I was listening to you chatting with Simon and, and Ben Fannin on their lockdown live, and like. We were about thirty minutes in to, to listen to you, and I'm like, I need to, I need to work with this guy. I need to reach out and, and get some help from him because I was struggling with some health issues that I was visiting my my GP with, and, and I had my bloods done twice, and they're telling me I'm a healthy, fit young man and stuff. And I'm like, am I becoming one of those hypochondriacs that just thinks there's something up with me? Turns out there was, there was quite a few things wrong, and, and Phil has helped me um, identify some issues and get on track with my health within you know within a few months' time, and I'm no longer kind of lost in limbo with that. So Phil has worked with everyone from elite uh, rugby teams, professional rugby, elite strength athletes, like uh, World's Strongest Man 2017, Eddie Hall, uh, Amir Khan, champion boxer, uh, to people who are just struggling with a lot of health complaints and want to lose weight and, and transform their health. We'll, we'll put you on to where you can follow Phil stuff after this. But um, Phil, I would like you to do a bit of an intro for us, mate. What What is it that you do just now? And how did you come about getting into this stuff? Well, what I'm doing at the moment, as, as you know, my expertise really is, if there's such a word as expertise, that is because you learn every day and the more you learn, the more you realize how little you actually do know. And that's that's been the biggest thing for me over 35 years of studying. Um, so presently, um, so I do I do a lot of blood work and I'll, I'll do blood work and stool work as well. I've got a, I've got a master's on stool work and, you know, some of the highest qualifications on um, blood chemistry. But the typical client I work with is is someone like Ed, you know, right away through to a stage four cancer patient and every single thing in between. You know, so for example, yesterday, um, in fact, this afternoon, I'll be working with these ex forces as well. Um, now, um, now a fireman, and ironically, he's got very similar to you, which was Ashimoto's, if I'm correct. That's what you had, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and ironically, he's got the same, you know, a mouthful of mercury fillings. Um, also, with him, which I did, I don't think we did with you, we, we looked at the gut as well, and there's a marker in the gut, um, called zonalin, which Whenever zonulin is high, and I'll explain what that is in a second, because it had a huge correlation with COVID-19 deaths as well. The higher zonulin is, the more immunocompromised you are. And um, and with with Hashimoto's, for those who don't know what that is, it's the immune system attacking the thyroid gland. And really, when the immune system attacks the thyroid gland, the immune system ends up attacking all the tissues. But the yeah. problem that is, you haven't got a problem with, with the thyroid, for example, the problem very very often manifest within the gut the gut is the key to health so i did a master's on the microbiome um because i knew you know from many years of studying clinical nutrition and sports nutrition and medical nutrition um 90 of problems are really manifesting in the gut you know and uh, you know and i think my biggest breakthrough you know, I've been written a number of books and worked at the highest level. And, and it's very easy to get caught in the woods and because there's so much data out at the moment. But about six months ago, um, I kind of come to the conclusion there's only real there's only three driving factors behind all non-communicable diseases like heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, obesity, dementia. Those are the five biggest killers in the Western world. And 
and when when I understood these three factors, which I'll explain what they are in a second, you'll realize that disease can be eradicated very easily in society, but disease is a trillion pound industry. And it really is, and that's not even being cynical. There's so much money in keeping people on their knees and suppressed and um, through disease. So what I discovered was the three driving factors, and in no particular order, that it's nutrient deficiencies, as I see from my lab work, you know, for example, in the current pandemic that we're in, you know, and you see, like when I look at the at the at the lab work, and like I did two courses on immunology one with Harvard and one with Toronto University. So I understand the subject. But what I realized with even with these universities, they'll never mention nutrition. They're so obsessed with vaccinations and medications. That will never resolve. Nobody is ever born with a vaccination deficiency or a medication deficiency. And what I discovered, like in the Science of Fat Loss online certification course I run, there's a four-hour webinar just on nutritional immunology, you know, just on how crucial... The immune system cannot function when you have certain nutrients deficient. And from the lab work that I do, I see those deficiencies in at least 98% of people, you know. And 80% 80, 80 of your immune system is actually housed in your gut, you know. And that's why I look at the gut as well. And I often see the first line of defense, which is the barrier wall in the gut, is just absolutely destroyed, as it is in the client I'll see later on. You know, so, um, you know, so what I discovered is if you've got nutrient deficiencies, a toxic overload, like what you had with the amount of mercury, and, and it's not just the mercury, you know, it's aluminium, it's parabens, it's pesticides, it's herbicides. We are swimming, and like there's a whole web that I give on this in the Science of Fat Loss as well. It's lesson four, which is all on the driving factor behind our obesity epidemic as well as the disease epidemic is the enormous amount of toxins. And those toxins interfere with the way that cells communicate with each other. So the immune system becomes dumbed down, the hormonal system becomes dumbed down, and so does the nervous system. And you've got to look at the human body is nothing more than a conglomerate of 50 to 70 trillion cells. And they all depend on the efficiency of communication amongst the cells. Now, it's no different to a population. If the, communi the communication gets distorted, then all of a sudden you get different factions going on, yeah? The message isn't getting through to what we want, which is continuity, for example. And then these cells start misbehaving badly. So when you've got nutrient deficiencies and you've got toxic overload, disease will always find you. There's the, it's Like disease, it's not bad luck. For someone to have cancer or to have a heart attack or dementia, or to be obese or to be diabetic is not barred genes and it's not barred luck. It's these factors. And the third one then is chronic long-term stress. So when you put in nutrient deficiencies, toxic overload and long-term stress, that is the absolute vesicle that we create internally that then ma manifests in some people, it, it can be cancer, in others it can be dementia, it can be obesity. You know, so name the disease. And then from something like the COVID-19, for example, the reason why that's had such an impact is because we live now in a society with chronically nutrient deficient people. So the immune system is completely suppressed with chronic toxic overload and then chronic stress. And then when you put that together, that's the perfect storm. And as I've said repeatedly, you know, vaccinating toxic nutrient deficient people still creates a toxic nutrient deficient person you know when you actually understand the immune system like i like i do it's insanity you know and that's not even an anti-vaccine rant the objective should be if the, if if the authorities really care and it's not the government because governments are here today and they're gone tomorrow you know they, they, they're just the voice of the people above that is suppressing the masses and you can keep people dumbed down if you keep feeding them shit food you keep on us i can't tell you how destructive the toxicity levels and the pesticides are having on every single living organism in this world you know and as i said if you keep listening then you know because stress then so you've got the nutrient deficiencies you've got the toxic overload and then the stress and the stress can be physical it can be emotional it can be chemical it can be financial but the body will always react to stress the same okay so it doesn't matter whether you go to a crossfit gym and do a CrossFit workout, 
or you come home and you find out you're 30 grand in fucking debt. The, you have the same chemical response to stress. That's the bottom yeah. line. So, so we've created the the perfect storm, you know, because you know, before I met you, you know, I'd written four books, but just before I met you, I just finished it writing my fourth book, which was titled Stop Killing Yourself with Your Knife, Fork, and Thoughts. And, and that was that took three years, literally full time. I you know, I was fortunate when I'd sold a company a couple of years ago and I could I had the luxury of just studying. And research and then that was the conclusion because there were six chapters in that book and the first chapter was on first of all evolutionary nutrition w what are we every species on this planet has got a particular diet that you know like if you have a hedgehog in fucking india he's not going to be on a completely different a diet to a hedgehog in fucking china it's very similar yeah you know it's a it's a you know it'll be a, a vegan type diet so you know i wanted to find out from a human what was the ideal diet and we are quite adaptable, and I think that's where the blood work comes into optimization on, like, your, you might thrive a lot more on carbohydrate, for example, and, and, and someone like myself might thrive a lot more on protein. But when you look at evolutionary nutrition, and, the, and we go back to the Hadza, for example, which are one of the last sort of nomadic undergatherer tribes, you can see that we thrive really, you know, you know, we do thrive. This is why that game changer film was the biggest pile of shit going. Okay, you know, which it was just total nonsense. You know, and for so many reasons, very really biased uh, documentary on. on yeah, it was just on. insane. I mean, if if I, if I had gone on, because ironically, as that was coming out, as I said, I just finished writing my fourth book, and it was very easy. That fourth book could have easily become a plant based diet book because a lot of the literature is very convincing on um, how important it is to state in the obvious first to consume vegetation. But what I discovered, because my fourth book was really going to be my second edition of the ketogenic diet book. And the reason it wasn't is at the same time I was doing a master's on the microbiome. And I realized that the gut microbiome, it absolutely has, when you, when you feed yourself, you're almost feeding two organs. You feed in the human organ, and you feed in the, the microbiome organ, which is far more, um, as a, much more of a presence than what we have. You know, they, the gut microbiome determines our health. Now, they do thrive on vegetation, you know, and they then in return create a lot of nutrients and a lot of repair materials that then heal us. If you piss off the microbiome, they'll destroy you. You know, they determine your mood, they determine your weight, your body fat composition, your hormonal response to foods, you know, the inflammatory response. So that's when I started shifting. That's when I th thought, fucking hell, you know, you know, actually, I will say this, the, the, the two worst diets, apart from the normal UK average diet, which is just shockingly shit, you know, it is the vegan diet and it is the ketogenic diet. They're the worst fucking diets that you can put people on the keto diet will work short term but as i like i've just finished writing the most comprehensive course ever written on the science of fat loss i wrote the most comprehensive book but the science of fat loss course has got 95 percent new content to what the book had which i finished publishing about seven years ago and the reason why i'm saying that is um if you want to make someone um ill put them on a keto keep put them on a keto diet long term and if you want to make them really fucking ill, put them on a vegan diet long term. It's just as simple as that, you know, because from an evolutionary perspective, neither one of those diets make any sense whatsoever. You know, and when you understand biochemical pathways and nutrition like I do, then you, you'll shake your head in disbelief and how bad those diets are. And your experience, Phil, what, why is it important for us to, to consume uh, animal meats and get a lot of our protein from, from those sources? Well, there's two reasons, but number one, on the animal protein, one of the most important markers to look at, and this is why the blood work is so important. You know, for example, if your ferritin levels, which is stored iron, is really, really high, that is so devastating for male and female. And in the UK, it's very, very common to have that, and especially amongst Celtic people, by the way. It's, there's something known as the Celtic curse, and it's called hemochromatosis. Um, where we produce, we absorb too much iron. And they've actually traced this gene back to Ireland over 40,000 years ago to an individual there when obviously food would have been so deprived of wherever. So 
this particular person developed an ability to absorb more iron because trying to get more iron out of the soil maybe or out of food when it was really scarce. Anyway, but um, Exeter University have just um, released some research as well showing that in the UK and in Europe, it's like one in five men have got this particular gene mutation. And I see this all the time when I look at the blood work and it's one in eight women. So the reason why I'm saying that first is if your ferritin levels are really high. Which may well, may well through the roof, aren't they? Yeah, that's when you've got to, in fact, I had another client yesterday and I've done his blood three times and he give blood, his, his ferritin levels are also off the chart. And just before the pandemic broke, he gave blood like three times in a year, so every four months, and he brought it right back into the sweet spot. Now, what that will do, it will probably add around seven years onto your life. That is how... So well, yeah, just routinely, routinely giving blood, which is two yeah. good causes then. Yeah, there's a, the, you, you, there's a between 40 and 70, I think it's nanograms per mil, your ferritin levels need to be. It's a, there's a real sweet spot on it. But the medical system, uh, you know, will allow up to 400. Which, because they're, they're, they're so uneducated. Um, for example, Japanese researchers show that in men, for example, when the ferritin is over 200 milligrams, um, then you're already start, you're, you're already start to significantly increase arterial cirrhosis, um, oxidative damage, brain degeneration, Parkinson's, you name it. And, and cancer and viruses use iron for replication. You know, so there's a very thin line. You want optimum amounts. You know, too little, you're on your knees, and too much, you're on your knees. So, so on the just, oh, sorry, Phil, just to, just to be uh, clear on that one, is that is, would you say that's good practice for for anyone just to regularly give blood? Well, they, make sure they know. The, the key is 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 to know your levels first. There's four yeah. iron markers that you need to know, but the most important is ferritin because ferritin is stored iron, and um, so it'll tell you if there's a if if you're over, as I said, if you're over a um, hundred on that maximum then I would recommend then you give blood every six to 12 months, you know, keep, keep checking those levels. It's very easy to check. And um, you want to keep it in the sweet spot, you know, which is between 40 and 70. That is the sweet spot. Um, you know, because once you do that, then you can eat copious. Like the guy yesterday, there's another marker with red meat as well. And not just red meat and white meat as well. And you're looking at something known as the omega six to omega three index. Yeah. Remember, I did your fatty acids. Yep. And um, if, because what what meat is, meat is awesome. But the problem that we have today is that we have exceptionally high levels of ferritin, and we have exceptionally high levels of omega six fatty acids. And what that will will create is disease. You know, because the omega six is a pro inflammatory fat, which you find in the so called vegetable oils, which are not vegetables; they simply seed oils things like safflower oil, sunflower oil, but the omega-6s are also coming through um, milk, meat, and eggs, and all of the dairy products. So when the omega-6 levels are high, and we've reduced omega-3 intake, can you remember what yours were, the omega-3 fats? They were really low. They, yeah. They won't be now because this, we've, we've, fixed, we've fixed that, but uh, I can't remember the, the exact number, but they were, they were well below the, the recommended the levels. Well, again, from a COVID perspective, for example, Simazon, they they found that, and I, I and I'll give you some real interesting stats. And this this is why people are dying so prematurely today. You know, as I said, exactly how I started this conversation. If you've got nutrient deficiencies, toxic overload, and chronic long term stress, disease will always find you. It's not bad luck. Now, the omega three fatty acids. So when you consume a lot of meat, which is hugely important, and I'll come back on to say why because. Like in the last couple of lessons of my science of fat loss, it's all on hypertrophy training, muscle building. And actually, the older you get, the more protein you must consume. And that just remind me to talk about the mTOR pathway, okay? And you'll see what I'm going with this. And for anyone listening who wants to put some size on, this is just fucking crucial because um, from a fat loss perspective, 99.9% .9 of people are doing it wrong. With fat loss, mm -hmm. what they are doing, you know, as you've seen from some of my posts, they focus in on the wrong tissue. They're trying to lose fucking fat, okay? Instead yeah. of, there's a completely different mindset when you have to gain muscle tissue, you know, and ask me some questions on that in a bit, and I'll give you the whole, you know, some just awesome. Yeah, that's there, actually some questions I've got noted down to, to, to cover. Yeah, well, what was interesting, when I did the first chapter, going back to the omega-3s of my last book, I discovered that there were certain nutrients that we 
very rarely consumed today that um, from an evolutionary perspective, when these nutrients are low, the body will always store fat, okay? And the, the, the three real big ones were vitamin D, vitamin C, and omega-3 fatty acids, and also if uric acid levels are high. So if you've got low D, low vitamin D, low vitamin C, low omega-3 fatty acids, that's 99% of people listening to this, okay? And you've got high uric acid levels, which would be about 50%. Don't, don't, don't worry about how hard you train, you're fucked anyway, because the body just goes, the body is, is really signaled to store. When you switch those nutrients into the sweet spot, the body will oxidize a lot more fat. Even just sitting here doing fuck all, the body will burn. Um, so going back, so, you know, looking at the omega-3 fatty acids, it's one of the biggest nutritional deficiencies. And, and, and again, going back to COVID, they found people, if you remember what your score was, I'm sure it would have been about two or three people below four. And what that means is 4% um, of their red blood cells contain an omega-3 fatty acids. They were far more likely to die of COVID. And I'll tell you why COVID, as I said, I, I knew all the met. I studied it for 12 months. I said I did two immunology courses with two world-class universities because I was so fed up of all the bullshit that was flying around. So I wanted to get the facts. And it was really interesting because what we've also found as well with omega-3 fatty acids, not only does it allow the body to build much more muscle tissue, it stimulates the mTOR part, which I'll talk about in a bit, the mammalian target of rapamycin. It's a long-winded word for muscle protein synthesis, but it can decrease the likelihood of dying of a heart attack by 90% if you can get your levels over 6%, okay? That's massive. So, yeah, it's huge. Those that are 4% and below compared to those that were 6.5% and above were 90% more likely to die of their first heart attack. Now, it is there's no drug in the world that could ever even come anywhere near that equation. You know, and the reason why you never hear about this is because there's no money in fucking fish oil for the pharmaceutical cunts, because that's what they are. It's the most corrupt organization in the fucking world. And um, it's just so evil. The more research I did over a 35-year period, you know, the more I realized just this, this, it's just do not rely on the fuckers and the white coats to save your ass because it ain't going to happen. And, you know, and that is not an attack on medicine because some parts of medicine are just fucking amazing. You know, emergency medicine is just incredible. The worst offenders in medicine is the general practitioner because what they are, and not deliberately, they are legal drug pushers of the worst drugs, way worse than what's being sold on the street corners. And I've, as I said, I've researched that. And I said, my conclusion is it's just, it's so bad. If the truth ever gets out, by God, I tell you what, people, you know, if people were only educated on those three things I've just spoke about, the nutrient deficiencies, the toxic overload, and the multiple stresses, you wouldn't see these hospitals being overloaded. by. But a lot of people are educated today not to look after themselves. You know, if you look at school, school should be the prime time for educational on health because there's no point having an academic sick person for the rest of your life because that sick person can't function in society. But um, there's, you know, you know, there's, there's unfortunately, <clears throat> as I said, there's no money in health, you know, and that's why it's the most important investment, you know, people can make as corny as that sounds. It's the fucking truth, especially today, because we are swimming in a sea of disease. Phil, so just uh, one on toxic overload, mate, because obviously I was suffering with some with some uh, toxins and we've seen that in my bloods and I've had to get the mercury fillings out. What, um, what are some of the most common things that create toxic overload in, in somebody, someone's blood and someone's body? Well, the tragic thing with toxins, first of all, um, is that they're invisible. You know, so for example, if you went to the supermarket and you had a non-organic apple next to an organic apple and they had to list the amount of pesticides that were sprayed on the non-organic apple and the known scientific side effects of those pesticides, every fucker would be buying the organic apple, you know, but because you can't see it. So like, so for example, pesticide laden vegetables and fruits will look amazing and people buy with their eyes. You know, you put a non-organic apple next to an organic apple, it looks like a shriveled up fucking testicle, yeah? You know, yeah. It, you know, and, and we get attracted to color and size, 
you know, but if only they knew the truth, because what I've discovered, I said, especially when I wrote that last book, every single section, so I said the second section was on, you know, there was 130 pages just on cancer in my, in my last book, you know, then it was on dementia, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, every section um, from a real trigger for these diseases were toxicity driven, you know, so, and things then that people don't realize, like yourself, when you had a face full of mercury fillings, mercury is the second most toxic um, poison in the world. Yet the Dental Association believed that it was safe to put it two inches from your brain. They've known for decades that mercury amalgam fillings leak. You know, the, the science on it was overwhelming. It's published in all their medical journals, but mercury is so devastating to every single cell in your body. And I know because I was mercury poisoned about 12 years ago, and I had idiopathic cardiomyopathy, which I did a bit more research into that, which is really an, an enlargement of the heart where you feel like you're drowning all the time. You can't get enough air in. It's just fucking, it's, it's hell on earth. An Italian research discovered with that particular disease that they were finding 22,000 times more mercury in the heart than those who didn't have that disease. That is how devastating. But, but just to make it simple, so like with you, for example, you had a lot of mercury in your body because it'll be in every single cell. It'll be in the bones, it'll be in the brain. And you had low omega-3 fatty acids as well. That will always create depression. It will always drop things like testosterone. All the hormones, all the receptors become desensitized. And that is analogous, for example. I always use the goldfish bowl analogy. If you can imagine your cells as goldfish in the bowl, you know, and if you were dropping mercury and then you were dropping pesticides in there, and you think of those goldfish as you sell, eventually the goldfish just cannot survive because they're only as healthy as the fluids they swim in. And we just become so, as I said, and then you malnourish the fish, and then you stress the fish, and then those fish fucking die, you know, and it's no different to the human. You know, we die in way, there's way, I mean, I've lost three people in the last nine days, all young people, you know, clients, you know, from heart attacks and cancer, and it's just, and, I, and when I look through their nutritional questionnaires, I'll tell you what, in every fucking one of them, five mercury fillings, three root canals, seven mercury fillings, two root canals, the biggest, they are the biggest causes of cancer. If you've got root canals and mercury um, and you try to eat organically and you eat, you know, and you exercise all the time, you're fucked anyway. You've got to remove yeah. poison. Because, like, we eat organic uh, our, our meat, organic, they're all grass-fed meats and stuff, and the vegetables, probably about, I would say, 90 percent organic we still eat out at restaurants and stuff yeah. sometimes but most yeah. of it and i still had i still had these issues you know and that's a lot of that was definitely coming from toxicities yeah oh without a doubt and it's in the deodorants you know you've got a shitload of aluminium you've got the drinking water if it's coming from the tap is you know it's it's it, and i'm not even being over dramatic because you know, once you once you gather this knowledge over a long time and you look at blood work and you look at stool work and you really understand the data, if people, for example, actually knew the amount of chemicals in their tap water, I can tell you now, they would they would get a reverse osmosis water filter fitted. You would not drink it. It is loaded with approximately 300 different types of chemicals. The reason why the water is clear as well is when it goes into the into the water plants, they treat it with aluminium. You know, so what you're drinking really is recycled piss with aluminium, you know, and, and, and that's what, you know, and if you look at water in nature, water in nature has got life. You know, it goes over pebbles, it's picking up ions, it's picking up minerals, it should be pure, it should be clean. We've got water which has been treated with hundreds of different types of chemicals. They can't get rid of a lot of the drugs like the, like the estrogen pill antidepressants and lots of other drugs now that they can't break down in these water plants. It travels to us in a straight pipe, you know, with a, you know, with a lot of chlorine in it, which is just devastating for the arteries as well as the microbiome. And we are drinking really, it looks nice again, because they know that people will drink. If that was mm -hmm. cloud or whatever, and like I've done water tests on tap water and there's a device which my mate was an expert on water you know, we developed one of the best reverse osmosis water machines available. Like it's in cancer hospitals, it's in a lot of premiership football teams. So he became an expert in testing tap water. And I swear to God, if you saw what was in the tap water, you'd never fucking drink it. 
it is so bad. But it's another. So what we've got today is a drip drip effect. Okay, so you've got pesticide laden foods. Okay, you've got pesticide laden meats. Yeah, because they're not feeding the fucking. Even if it says um, you know free range or whatever, um, I'd be quite. Even though I'd go for free range over conventional, a lot of the stuff that's being fed to these animals is not organic. You know, they're yeah. not feeding organic grains, etc. Like for example, one of the worst foods you can have is farmed fucking salmon from Scotland. Yeah, when you knew, when you know how. What's really interesting with the farmed salmon, by the way, is is that their omega-6 content is off the fucking chart. And the reason why is the pellets that they feed them is very high in omega-6s, you know. But what you've got is also the vibration of the actual animal itself. Because when the, you know, in this case, the fish, when fish or animals are stressed, they also create a lot of stress hormones, which is stored in the meat. And as bizarre as that sounds, it's true. It doesn't disappear. You know, you're eating the vibrations, you're eating the stress, you're eating the chemicals, you know, so things like that are having, you know, you know, so, you know, because we can talk all day, but the bottom line is you're trying to optimize your nutrition, you're trying to detoxify and absolutely de-stress, you know, things like I'm a real big um, proponent and I write about this quite a bit in my, in my course of like um, earthing, you know, so barefoot walking. You know, if you look at what's happened to humans over the last, you know, you know, especially in the last 150 years, but we've moved away from everything. We, we, are, we are swimming in not only a sea of toxicity, but also a sea of electrical magnetic fields. And the EMFs are also have an incredible detrimental effect on the immune system as well as the endocrine system. We live now off the ground. You know, if you look at indigenous people, especially in the Amazon and in Africa, they, they're always barefoot because when you when you connect to the earth, there's an enormous amount of what is known as electrons. Electrons, yeah. yeah. It'll come into the body. It, you know, I, I spent years, for example, looking at blood under a microscope and, you know, I read some research with some real top cardiologists and what they were doing, they were looking at blood before and after earthing, you know, after barefoot walking. And I saw this a lot of times as well, where in a lot of people, the blood is clumped together. It's really sticky. It's deoxygenated. You know, within 30 minutes of barefoot walking on grass or sand, boom, you know, it's all vibrant. You know, but it's a huge anti-inflammatory as well. So we've just moved away from everything. We've moved away from sunshine. We've moved away from, you know, barefoot walking. We've moved away from foods which were meant to have earth on them. You know, that's where all the soil microorganisms which colonize our gut. You know, we've created, as I said, the perfect storm for disease. And like from a performance perspective, which has been my life for 35 years, don't, this is why people are seeing so little results in the gym, because they fucked. Yeah, they saw so toxic, they saw so malnourished, they saw so stress. Exercise is nothing more than stress. You know, and that's why I studied health and nutrition so vividly because I knew if I can get my athletes healthy, well nourished, then I can stress them and they can respond to the stressor. You know, that was all. There was always a reason for you know for for taking that path. Yeah, so I think it'd be probably a good time to uh, ask you a couple of questions and just just clear up so the, the people who are listening have got like a few steps that they can at least action on just now. So in terms of toxicities. Some of the best things that they, they can do that's within their control right now is one, start switching to, to organic foods. Two, invest in a, a reverse osmosis water filter. Yeah. And three, if, if you've got any fillings or root canals in your mouth, then, you know, get the get the wallet out and go and see. A, a, probably, a, is it right to see a, a specific mercury-free dentist? That's yeah. what I did. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, Never go to one that's still putting mercury in because they have no respect. You know, they, they are. I mean, it should be a crime against humanity. As strong as that sounds, any person that puts in one of the most toxic substances into a human being is a psychopath. You know, but they, they hide behind all this. And I, I'll add the fourth thing they need to get as well, which is not that expensive, is an infrared sauna. You can get a tent. Yeah, you know, you can go into Amazon. I mean, I've got one upstairs. And, you know, I spend at least 30 minutes in there four to five times a week. And not only does that detoxify you, but I tell you what, from a hypertrophy perspective, and again, I cover this a lot in my course, um, it, it develops something known as heat shock proteins. It actually increases um, muscular gains 
but it also increases growth hormone by at least 160 percent as well so you know but as a detoxifying agent it's just insane we get rid of toxins through four channels okay so this this will sum all this up through urination so you've got to make sure optimum hydration with clean drinking water um respiration so real you know real sort of you know hit type training yeah high intensity interval type training um defecation the bowel health is crucial and this is why you know copious amounts of especially cruciferous vegetables are very very important and also things like fermented foods as well because i said the bowels of a huge say in your health the microbiome and then then the fourth so it's urination defecation respiration and I, the other one will come to me but they're the big players you know so there's four limb and, and the and the liver is almost like the general in this you know and this is why i look at liver markers because if the liver is struggling which is very common today then those pathways of eliminations are significantly inhibited and, and then what happens then you just get a more of a build up in the body so respiration yeah. perspiration urination and defecation you know that's what you've really got to make though and on blood and stool work you can see if those pathways are working superb mate thanks uh so moving on to like uh, fat loss uh, in general now as a, as a result what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making like whether whether somebody's got two stone three stone to lose or whether they're just trying to get leaner um lose a little bit of belly fat and, and tone up per se well, the biggest thing is what they do in first is that they try to approach it already in a disease state. So, for example, you know, and again, this is why I went into blood chemistry analysis and stool analysis in a big way. OK, because all these before and after pictures, I put a post on Facebook not so long ago saying I'd be more impressed if I saw the before blood tests and the after blood tests than the pictures. Yeah. You know, for example, um, if you go onto my site, there is a great picture. There's a course that I used to run, um, Strength Training for Athletic Development. If you scan down right to the bottom, you'll see a picture. And I never did before and after pictures, but this is a great example of what I'm talking about. There's a 28-day before and after picture. Um, and she was an, like, she, she was an ex-international athlete, and she had 28 days to prepare for a Miss Fitness, where in the morning they do all these, like, 400 meters 800 meters 200s hundreds and in the afternoon they do bikini cut a long story short um you know in in 28 days fuck me the transformation was amazing but what we didn't realize at the time because i was consulting via um a, another person is that she had stage three breast cancer you know so, you know you know uh, not shortly after that she had both breaths removed and everything but she looked amazing you know the before and after was just fucking incredible but if we had done the blood work, we would have spotted it a million miles away. And in men, what you're going to see in men, for example, the before and after, and I write about this extensively because when you lose fat over a 12-week period and you drop a significant amount, you, you absolutely release so much toxins which are stored in fat cells into the circulation which have now ended up in your brain, in your heart, in your liver, in your kidneys, and especially in the thyroid gland. And again, I cover, I, I, I go through all the research in my books and in my courses. And then, so what you've done really, when you do fat loss today, first of all, you've got to make sure you know what your current state of health is, okay? Because you can't put somebody through the mill. I, I can, I've trained the best of the best in the world. It's fucking easy in the gym and get somebody on their knees spoon in a bucket. Any fucking Muppet can do that. <laughs> A different type the, the the whole industry needs to start shifting is that you that you actually you don't have to be an expert in blood work and stool work but you actually know the state of the health of the person you have because that will determine the intensity of the program and also the response because you can't yeah. respond to like high intensity interval training and a hypertrophy training if you've got chronic inflammation, you've got high levels of C-reactive protein in the body, you've got high levels of homocysteine, you know, you've got a liver, which is just very, and I could go on because I look at 130 mark, as you, as you know. So my, my, my thing today, is, you know, and it's not what trainers want to hear because it's too fucking difficult, as, as I discovered, but what, what you should know is the state of the health of the client first because that, as I said, determines the actual training program. And it also determines, for example, you could have a client 
that has got exception, you know, I'll, I'll state the obvious first, because I see this in 95% of men, very, very low testosterone levels, okay? And testosterone levels today are in the basement for so many reasons. And I have to say the biggest reason for this, because I, I, I've done a four-hour webinar just on fucking testosterone in the Science of Fat Loss course, is toxicity. Toxicity is the biggest killer of testosterone. And, and I go into why that's the case. There's, there is a pathway for it. But the, the point I'm making now, so if I've got, say, I've got James, he's a new client. I don't do any testing, but I'm a world-class strength and conditioning coach. I don't need to test. I can take him in the gym. I'll start training him. You know, 12 weeks later, yeah, he's lost a bit of body fat and he's gained a little bit of muscle, but nowhere near what we thought. Then I do some lab work on him and I see, fuck me dead, you know. His testosterone levels are in the absolute basement. His vitamin D levels are, his omega-3 fatty acids are, his vitamin C levels. But if only I had got them in the sweet spot, we would have seen a miracle. But not only would we have seen an exceptionally um, awesome physical transformation, but we would have seen a health transformation as well. You know, as I said, anyone can do the before and after. There's a huge difference. So, you know, I know I went a bit wrong-winded. You know, so first of all, know your client. Know the markers, okay? Because this is why this course that I put together, which is 35 years of work, by the way, will, will change the whole industry for the better. Because you could be training somebody. Like I had a 36-year-old guy about 18 months ago drop dead with a heart attack. He was as fit as a fucking fiddle. You know, he wasn't one of my clients. I only met him previously in a, in a gym. He was ironically the manager there, you know, and I got, you know, friendly with him because we were from the same place. And, um, you know, I went back about three months later saying, well, where's this guy? He said, drop dead with a heart attack. I tell you, you would have seen it with a, you would have seen it a million miles off on a blood chemistry analysis. So, as I said, so whether it's something as extreme as that, or if somebody, for example, has got very high levels of omega-6 fatty acids, and very low levels of omega threes, they don't make the gains. They'll they'll really struggle. So know your client, and then absolutely the biggest mistake that people make is um, is that they try to lose fat. It's the biggest fucking yeah. biggest mistake you can do because you mean like they try to cardio it off. They'll try to cardio. They'll try to high rep it and and everything else. And to yeah. be honest with you, look, you know, ninety nine percent of people train with the intensity of a hamster taking a shit anyway. Okay, because <laughs> Because they, they, they have, they, they, because the body is not dull. Even driving to the gym, every single cell in their body, which is full of toxins and full of malnourished sin, you fucking take it easy today. Now, there's a marker on the blood chemistry analysis which tells me whether you're training hard or not, okay? And that's what I love about the blood work. And the reason why I mention that, I have people in my clinic saying, I train six days a week. I don't know why I'm losing weight. I go straight to that mark and I say, you're not training six days a week. You're attending a facility which has got some equipment in. I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but you're not using it. Um, you know, and also, secondly, people have got no idea on the amount of effort it actually is required to get hypertrophy gains. You do get a lot of non-responders as well. The blood work will normally tell you who are the non-responders and the responders. So, for example, I've got research where they had like 12 sets of identical twins that were put through exactly the same strength program for 12 weeks, okay? You know, and they were supervised, you know, by elite strength and conditioning coaches. You had some sets of twins gaining some like 14 pound of lean muscle tissue and you had others losing four pound of muscle. There, um, there's a massive difference as well in individual response. But to cut a long story short, the most important thing that that client needs to do to lose weight is to 100% train like a bodybuilder. There'll be different different reps for different fiber types so for example as i discovered that was the good thing working in professional rugby for so long i, I mean i had the you know the you know the sort of ability then to observe fast twitch fibers mixed twitch fibers and slow twitch fibers what were the best responses so for example a winger in rugby is a fast twitch fiber animal okay they do really good on on explosive type trainers and low reps, they get unbelievable gains. Now, a back rower in rugby, yeah, is more of a mixed to slow twitch fiber. They do much better on bodybuilding type training. They thrive on much higher reps. But the bottom line is you've got to take the body to failure. And if you don't take that body to failure, but at least the, you know, coming into at least the sort of last two or three reps, the body has got no reason to build muscle tissue. One of the biggest things that I learned 
over years from an evolutionary perspective for the body to lay muscle tissue down the body then needs more calories to sustain that muscle tissue because as we know muscle is a lot more metabolically active than fat fat is inert but what fat does when it's over a certain percentage is release a plethora of um what is known as cytokines which are very pro-inflammatory causes a fucking a plethora a shitload of problems so what muscle can do once you build in muscle it can if you if you actually understand nutrient time it can build it can pull an enormous amount of energy out of fat stores to actually help to build the muscle tissue so to build muscle is enormously energy consuming and from, as i said from an evolutionary perspective we didn't know when the next meal was coming from we couldn't store food so the body is not dull there needs to be a fucking strong stimulus for that event to take place okay and yeah you will get other people there are definitely people who can you know not train as hard and make incredible gains but the bottom line is you really need to strain to gain it's as simple as that otherwise the body's got no reason to and then from a nutritional perspective there is something known as i've talked about this earlier on the mTOR pathway and so that's the mammalian target of rapamycin and and when you're under 30 you can stimulate that through you know there's three there's three mechanisms to stimulate it it's your um, protein content especially leucine amino acids yeah um hormone levels and then mechanical damage so strength strength training when you get past 30 35 40 you kind of the hormones are starting to become not only much less but the receptors are becoming much less inhibited as well so then protein becomes your big player in this in this animal and we know from the research you need at least you know i would say um between 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram that is minimum of protein per meal and it needs to be very high quality protein you know so what i do with my athletes and my clients I get them to take a cocktail. I think I got you to do the same as well. Yeah, the leucine, the creatine, and the glutamine about yeah. 30 minutes before meals. And what that does, it, it ensures that the meal that you consume will trigger the mTOR pathway. But there's also another protein um, which is not really well known called myostatin. And myostatin is one of evolution's sort of tricks to allow us not to build muscle at an enormous level otherwise we couldn't have fucking moved so myostatin is it's it's, it's a myokine it's released by muscle cells um so it prevents you from and some people like eddie all for example has got a myostatin um deficiency that's why ed can build so much muscle you know so that's when i really started looking into myostatin and I realized, fucking hell, if we can decrease myostatin and we can upregulate the mTOR pathway, even somebody that is genetically struggling can make significant gains. And one of the most important things to, you know, to stimulate the mTOR pathway is optimum protein. But to, to inhibit, to decrease myostatin, the most important supplement, which is the, the forgotten hero of the supplement world, is creatine. Creatine is just fucking amazing at um increasing testosterone and decreasing myostatin you know and also when you really understand like muscle physiology like i do the creatine along with optimum amount of carbohydrates for glycogen storage this is this is important as well because this is why i'm so anti-keto diet as well because the brain can sense right if you've got optimum amounts of creatine and 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 um glycogen within the muscles which is stored carbohydrate the brain will send a much stronger contraction to the muscle when you're training because it knows it's got a shitload of available energy so you can be much more violent and aggressive in your strength training approach to somebody going in there a vegan you'll end up just hugging the fucking dumbbell a keto you know there's there's no there's there's no storage within the muscle so you're you're not really getting out of the jail and that but if you can carbohydrate time so again, I give a whole seminar on my new course on nutrient timing because carbohydrates used at the right times because of the stimulation of insulin is the most anabolic thing you can do. So it will also decrease. Now, what's interesting, what increases myostatin, which really crushes your ability to gain um, muscle tissue, the worst thing is stress. Cortisol levels will completely, and also low calorie. So if you drop your calories, and you increase your cardio, you've increased your stress levels, you increase the myostatin levels, 
And yeah, you lose weight short term, but long term, the fucking tide comes in even higher. Okay, and then it gets harder to lose, and that's what people do. So my advice is, I said, I said, I mean, I, the, you know, it's a whole fifty-hour course on explaining what I'm giving you here is to focus on one hundred percent. You know, a real mixture of hypertrophy training with high-intensity interval training, and you know, does cardio have any place in it? It all depends on your fiber type. Yeah, you know, and also because people think of cardio as somebody sitting on an exercise bike or a running machine, you know, doing the fucking speed of a fucking hamster. Yeah. Now I trained, like I trained Olympic athletes, and I used to I used to train a, a, an Olympic three thousand meter steeplechaser. And the reason why I'm telling you this is, and I'm also believe it or not, an ex elite runner. Now cardio, if it's done properly. Is fucking balls to the wall. You know, we're like a BFT in the army, yeah? yeah? You know, so if you've done a BFT, for those who don't know, is like one and a half miles as fucking hard as you can, yeah? And you run one and a half miles as hard as you can, that's one of the hardest sessions you'll ever fucking do. Yeah, I think my, my best time was like 8.02 or something like that, and that's like, you know, horrendous. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, without bragging, I was about seven, you know. I mean, I, I you know, I, I I, did 10 miles in 51 minutes, you know, with a fucking hangover, you know, and I actually... The <laughs> guy was, you always know, with a hangover, mate. Yeah, always with a hangover. But the point I'm saying there is, like, you know, is don't mix cardio up with what the fitness industry perceives cardio, because going back to the Olympic steeplechase that I, I used to train... He had the best physique I've ever fucking seen. You could not believe. I used to have guys interning with me, trainers from all over the world. And if they were on an internship when I was training, he was the oldest Olympic athlete, by the way, at the 2012 Olympic Games in the GB squad, you know. And you know, and I managed to get him to two Olympic Games. And and again, the reason why I mentioned like Stu would train like you should train, like a fucking animal. But people think of cardio, you know, as fucking a little jog three mile jog or whatever, you yeah. know, or sitting on a bike for 30 minutes with, as I said, the intensity levels of a fucking hamster taking a shit. That's not cardio, you know, cardio. If you're going to do cardio, you know, do 30, 40 minutes and this fucking boards or do a one and a half mile run. We know actually, you know, and ironically, I'm just finishing off um, a seminar on thyroid and mitochondria and to really upregulate the mitochondria because what people I've mentioned mTOR, and I mentioned myostatin, and the big thing that people don't understand with fat loss is something to do with mitochondria, which are um, simply organelles which live within the cells, which will turn food into fuel. And 95% of our energy conversion are done within the mitochondria. So we, we'll have over 10 pounds of mitochondria within the body. There's like 10 million billion mitochondria. Now, what's really interesting with that as well is that we know that high intensity interval training is crucial for mitochondrial upregulation for their efficiency. So they become more efficient at turning your food into fuel instead of turning the food into fat storage. Okay. Now there are there's one main hormone that will have a huge effect on the mitochondria. And I'm seeing more and more people who are struggling with, and it's the thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone plays an incredible role in mitochondrial, what is known as biogenesis, which is production of new mitochondria, and also their efficiency. And then going back to toxicity. That comes back to the gut performance again, because that has effect on the thyroid. Yeah, it does, yeah. And then the thyroid then affects the mitochondria. So everything's interconnected. But the problem with medicine, for example, it treats everything as like, a it, it, like if you had a thyroid problem, it treats the thyroid. If you've got a thyroid. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and the, the body doesn't work like that. But one of the, the most detrimental things to mitochondria is um, pesticides. Pesticides, what pesticides do in pests is knock out their mitochondria. And when we consume the pesticides on the foods, it absolutely destroys our mitochondria. The two worst offenders for mitochondria, and you've got both of them, was mercury and, uh, and pesticides. And I have to say the third real burden as well is statins. Statins destroy mitochondria. Statins are the the worst medication you can ever take for anything, if I'm honest with you. Um, but for mitochondria, it just totally destroys them. So you can see, like as I said, 
if you it, it, you know all these before and after pictures i said i'm not imp I, I don't give a fuck about them because like i've spent so many years studying this you know and this is why the last three years you know i've kept really out of the out of the public eye because i was so busy in fact the last five years really i was so busy putting this course together because i thought i've got to change this fucking industry you know because i said there'll be somebody today that is 42 years of age you will have a heart attack right i don't know if you know this but i think it's over 450 people a day in the uk will die of a heart attack yeah every two every two to three minutes somebody will have a heart attack and the point is when you know like there's a four-hour webinar again in the science of fat loss just on nutritional cardiology and I think it's the most important webinar in the whole course, even though the course is called The Science of Fat Loss. If you can save someone's fucking life by recognizing when you look at a blood chemistry panel and you see certain markers where you know if they don't get these markers back into the optimum ranges, it's not if this guy is going to have a heart attack, it's fucking when this guy is going to have a heart attack. So I have a, I have a, a quite an important question on, on that point, Phil, before we finish up. Um, what's the reason that a lot of these things aren't getting picked up through blood tests uh, at the, the standard GP? Because obviously I had my bloods done for several things like uh, yeah. twice within a three year period and they kept kind of fobbing me off and saying I'm perfectly healthy, but we found different when we did your blood panel. Well, there's two reasons. Um, number one, um, blood chemistry analysis, first of all, it's a science. As I discovered, you know, it, it's taken many, many years to interpret blood markers. And you've got to know what blood markers that you actually need to look at. And secondly, they don't run a comprehensive panel. So let me use let me use cholesterol as an example, okay? So, and it's not the GP's fault. The GP, the more drugs a GP can get a client on, the more that surgery gets in money-wise and the bigger the house they fucking live in, okay? And that's, again, is not even being cynical. So if we look at cholesterol, Number one, cholesterol has zero correlation with heart disease, okay? So that's number one. Number two, if you had high cholesterol in there, right, they will put you on a statin medication. But the problem with, with cholesterol in regards to blood testing and something like heart disease, there are probably 25 blood markers which they don't test for, which can tell you how close you are towards a heart attack. So we're looking at things like high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is a marker which is telling us how much inflammation is actually going on in the arterial wall because heart disease and heart attacks and strokes, it's an inflammatory disease, okay? So you've got to look at the, uh, the level of inflammation within that person. The most important marker, for example, you know, this is why it's always undetected. And in the, in the nutritional cardiology section, I actually use, uh, let me give you this example before we go, because it's so fucking powerful, because this was a 40-year-old male, right? So if we go back to the cholesterol, um, his cholesterol levels were perfect, his HDL, his LDL, his triglycerides. Now, if I was a dumbass GP, I'd say, you, you're just, you know, you're an amazing cardiovascular health. Now, just above that, there was something known as high sensitivity C-reactive protein, as I just mentioned. And there's another marker called lipoprotein phospholipase A2, which is a long-winded word, again, for how much inflammation is going on in the arteries. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. They were just off the charts. Okay, Now, this guy also had cancer as well. But I, I remember he was dead within 12 weeks, by the way. And I knew that he would be dead within 12 weeks when I saw how high the CRP levels were. Now, I had another client then with high cholesterol, um, with high triglycerides, but the CRP levels were zero, and the other marker I just mentioned was also zero. He had he had no there was no chance of this guy having a heart attack. But his GP would have thought your cholesterol's high, your triglycerides. Yeah, the was at high risk. It's this guy. It's the it, so they're looking at the wrong things. They don't know. You know, as I said, it took me several years. You know, I did the most advanced courses in the world on blood chemistry. So a they don't know. And the markers that they use, they have a standardized marker, okay? So, for example, let me give you testosterone as an example. So, in a male, it's between 8 and I think it's 32, okay? In, in optimum medicine, it's between 24 and 28, okay? That, that's where you want to be. But your standard medical reference, which are GPs, it's so enormous that so many people just fall through the for the gaps and like for your thyroid hormone for example they would never have checked the antibodies 
So we looked at about eight markers on your thyroid and we picked it up on the antibodies. And they never they never do that. They never look they never look at anything in enough detail to actually give a picture. And this is why so many people will fall through the net, you know. So, you know, you know, that's that's the reason why. Luke's just commenting. What a great insight. Phil, do you have a website I can check out, please? He does. He does. Is, uh, is it Phil Richards Nutrition Lab? Yeah, it is. Yeah, and it's all being revamped because at the moment it's, it's there's enough information on there and stuff like the blood, you know, the male panels on there, the stool panel, the science of fat loss course on there. But in the next, because I've just been so busy researching, and it's been a fucking privilege, you know. So you know, we'll we'll come on again and just and we can just talk about singular things if you want, you know, like yeah, that would be fantastic and stuff like that. And I'll I'll send this out to because I've got a lot of other guys that follow me through uh, my emails and stuff. So I'll get I'll get this to them as well, so they can get eyes on this stuff because it's really important. I think I think this is a strong message you've got, mate. Uh, I've got I've got just a couple of questions, but it'll take a little minute before we finish up because some of my guys were asking some things. Um, Satch was asking uh, about the influence that genetics has on nutrition in, in relation to to fat loss. Like, are some people more genetically um, disposed to do better on? low carbs and paleo type diets in, in terms of losing fat in your experience? I think one of the biggest things, it's a great question because I don't think people realize the enormous um, impact that genes actually do have on obesity. It was much bigger than I actually thought. It's, it's around 70%. And to put that into perspective, your height is only determined by genes by 82%. Your weight is determined by 70%. So, for example, if you had, let me use a, 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 a real life study. It was one of the largest studies done on identical twins that were separated at birth and then they were followed up for years later then to see on their weight levels. What they discovered, if you had lean parents, right, who had the twins and they went into a fat household, even 20 years later, that lean twin still stays lean in the fat household, okay? Exactly the opposite, okay? Fat twin born from fat parents. This is at birth, by the way, because I want to explain nature nurture as well, okay? Because if you have fat parents who have identical twins, and you can have one of those identical twins going into a lean household and one going into the fat household, whatever the fucking parents were, if they were overweight, no matter what the household or the nurturing or the diet, they still normally end up becoming fat. But there is hope as well. So there, there's a huge genetic component with obesity, much higher because what people don't realize is that humans are the fattest mammals on the planet. We, are, we have got an incredible ability to store fat. And the reason why is we haven't got a voluminous amount of fur in our body. So over millions of years of evolution, we lay down fat. We have got the same body fat at birth as a seal. We have got exceptionally high levels of body fat. And the thing with humans is we are exceptionally good at storing fat and we are exceptionally bad at burning fat. There are a plethora of hormonal and brain mechanisms in place. The moment you reach a set weight and your body is happy with that set weight, and then you might not be happy with it when you look in the mirror, but then you start losing it. Two to three million years of evolution will kick in and it will fucking crush you. And that's why if you focus on building muscle instead of losing the weight, You'll, you'll offset the two to three million years of evolution. But 100% genes absolutely play a massive role. And the, for, the, for example, I've got a, 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 um, a scientific paper in this course showing they had four groups, and I'll make this very quick, where they, you had one group that could drink as many sugared beverages as they wanted to and not gain a molecular weight. And you had another group which they genetically looked at their genes. They only had to drink one sugared beverage and they already started laying down fat. Okay, so there is a huge variation. And I could go on because I write about yeah. it enormously in my first in the first lesson of this course I run. Sweet. Uh, quickly, the last one. We've, you already kind of covered it anyway. It's like uh, Ron was asking about testosterone uh, is the best way to, to find out your level to, to test it in bloods, and obviously that is. And if required, what are the best ways to increase them? I, I would I would say the stuff we've already talk, spoken about. We did mention it. Um, decreasing toxic loads and you know and all those things. Well, on the blood work as well, because if you, you you can't just look at total testosterone. You've got to look at total testosterone. You've got to look at bioavailable testosterone. You've got to look at free testosterone. Mm -hmm. You've got to look at sex hormone binding globulin. 
you've got to look at estradiol levels and you've got to look at DHT levels. And the reason why I say that is you can have a guy that has got optimum levels of testosterone. This is what another reason mine, why the GPs, mine was through the roof, but I wasn't using it, it wasn't yeah, bioavailable. Exactly. You had um, very little DHT, I think. So from an anabolic perspective, you could train, but you don't gain, you know, and that's yeah. And the other big thing that's never over, never looked at as well when people look at blood markers is there's something known as androgen receptors. Okay, so you can have all the testosterone available in the world, even the DHT levels, the high dehydrotestosterone, which is very androgenic. But if you if you are full of um, toxicity levels, and um, and there's a few other things because there's like a whole chapter on this. Um, what we know, for example, they did a 12 week trial with men on on weight training and what they discovered was it wasn't those of the highest testosterone levels that gained the most muscle it was those with the most receptive receptors and what i've done what i discovered is how to increase those receptors and things like even the way um even the way you do the repetition so for example if you were doing a pull-up if you pull up as fucking explosively as you could then you pause at the top and then you come down for four seconds we know that that type of um, tempo really upregulates, and also um, intermittent fasting and vitamin D. Vitamin D is one of the most important. You'll always see if somebody's got low testosterone, they've usually got low vitamin D. They work synergistically, but vitamin D upregulates the androgen receptors, and so does fish oil. Omega-3 fatty acids also upregulate. And I should say one other thing as well. It's something known as L-carnitine. You know, L-carnitine, which is... Um, an amino type acid type of formula which transports fats in the mitochondria, but it also upregulates. So, you know, when I do blood work and I look at the, you know, um, stool and all that, that's when you can get the pre, during, and post workout nutrition right as well, because that's another massive mistake that people make when they're trying to lose fat. They do it fasted, okay? If you want to do it fasted, you end up long term just becoming a smaller, fatter version of yourself than what you fucking started. You know, and, and that's why if you get the aminos right and the post workout right as well, you know, you've got, I said it's a different mentality going into the gym to build muscle and to lose fat. You become yeah. an animal when you build a muscle. You just become a fucking fanny when you build when you're losing fat because everything's light and you fucking cardio. There's no there's no stimulus. There's no you know you, you you're lowering your calories. So every time you lower the calories and you up your exercise, three million years of evolution says I'll fucking crush your balls. Okay, and that's that's what happens. You 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 won't beat the system. Yeah, totally get that, mate. Thanks very much for the the straight up army PTI advice. Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's no other way Stand around on, it. Mate. Stand yeah. on, mate. No, no cutting about the bush. All right, Phil, listen, uh, it would be great to have you on again, mate, for a, for a part two. Thank you very much. This has been very insightful. And I know they get the guys who are listening have, have gained a lot from this. So they can find your stuff at Phil, Phil Richards Nutrition Lab. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Phil, appreciate it, mate. Thanks yeah. very much. Enjoy your weekend. Yeah, Thanks no worries, buddy. Cheers, Pat.